Remember when you were young, was there something that you used to collect and trade with your friends? Maybe stamps, or marbles, or some form of sports cards? For me, it was Pokemon. I wasn't walking around with the app, I was collecting the cards. I used to take them to school and battle them with all my friends. We used to trade them and we used to try to catch them all. One of those friends was Alex. Alex lived really far away and always really wanted a Charizard, which I had. I really wanted a Pikachu, which he had. So it made sense that we should swap. There was only one problem. I didn't trust Alex. He was a known Pokemon thief. <laughs> so we needed some way to establish trust in this trade. Luckily, our friend Callum didn't care about Pokemon, and he was going to visit Alex. So we each gave him our cards, along with some lollies, and he facilitated the trade. Everything happened according to plan. So in primary school, my friends and I were able to create a way to trade cards around the world without having to trust Alex. <laughs> there was only one problem here. This was all built on our trust in Callum. What would happen if Callum decided that he liked Pokemon? What would happen if Callum demanded more and more lollies each time we wanted to trade? If you think about it for a minute, this is like how our financial system has grown throughout the ages. It's really easy to establish trust with cash. You just hand it over and receive something right on the spot. If I give you a $20 note, you know that I can't go and spend that $20 elsewhere because it's now in your pocket. Increased globalization means that we can't pay for everything with cash. More and more of the world's transactions now occur online, where it is harder to establish trust. The current global economy relies on transactions between parties that do not trust each other. We rely on trusted third parties like Callum to verify whether digital money has been spent or not. When we were young, we paid Callum in lollies. In the grown-up world, we pay banks money, and we pay them lots of money to do this. This works because banks recognize each other as trustworthy counterparts, and it's such good business for them. Together, they bring in $1.7 trillion a year in global payment services. But do we really need them there? In 2008, in the wake of the global financial crisis, at a time when people were losing trust in banks and the traditional finance sector, Bitcoin emerged as a new kind of money. Two months after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Bitcoin proved that it is possible to establish trust and do transactions without going through a third party. The technology that made this possible was blockchain. Blockchains enable the emergence of a global source of truth from a collection of distrustful and potentially malicious entities. The World Economic Forum has named blockchain technology as being akin to the introduction of the internet. The internet allowed global sharing of information. Blockchain technology will allow global sharing of assets. But what actually is a blockchain? It is an unchangeable ledger of online records. This ledger is public and shared amongst a network of computers all around the world. It is append only, meaning that you can only add, not change or remove data. This means that no one individual, company, or even country can control or change a record. Once entered on a blockchain, data is permanent and can never be deleted or hacked. Its explanation may be complex, but the upshot of its application is simple. We are entering a period of time when trust is no longer required. Technology has reached a point where we will no longer need to trust a central entity to manage any transactions. The Bitcoin blockchain was the first of many blockchains. There are so many more that now exist. The hype is no longer around Bitcoin or digital currency. It is about removing friction from any transaction-related process. People can create smart contracts on a blockchain for any purpose, even purposes that we are yet to imagine. Once placed on a blockchain, these smart contracts are there forever. 
No one is able to change conditions after the fact. They can even self-execute once these conditions are met. They make it possible to sell real estate, stocks, or almost any other kind of asset without a broker. For any kind of non-monetary asset, it is important to have accurate records of who owns what. If I own a piece of land, I don't want you to also claim to own that same piece of land. And I definitely don't want you to hack into a database and change ownership from my name into your own. This is why we currently rely on third parties, like land registries, to maintain ownership records of our property, or vehicle registries to maintain ownership of our cars. The reason why these people exist is to establish trust between people that don't trust each other. So what I am saying is, thanks to blockchain technology, for the first time now in human history, people everywhere can establish trust and do transactions without a third party. If ownership records are maintained on a blockchain, it is possible for me to transfer ownership of anything directly to you with no third party interference. Everyone knows that this transfer has taken place. It is guaranteed to be safe and secure. Nobody can challenge the legitimacy of this transfer. Trust is established not by some big institution, but by mathematics and by collaboration. With the evolution and rise of the Internet of Things, a future use of smart contracts is to embed them in physical objects like cars or even houses. These smart contracts would then provide access only to their rightful owner based on the agreed terms of the contract. Imagine that. Objects that can run code. Objects that are fully autonomous. What would this even look like? So imagine renting an Airbnb. Before you get there, all of the internet-connected devices within the house are uploaded with information about your date of arrival and your digital wallet. Then, whenever you want to release a service within that house, whether that be accessing the Wi-Fi, opening the fridge and getting a beer, or even taking the autonomous car for a trip down to the beach, you send a request for that service to the house. The funds are deducted automatically from your account with no third-party interference from credit card intermediaries. What about a transaction that's even more important than this? What about the most important transaction that we make? On election day, when we go to vote, we are deciding the fate of our country. It's high-stakes stuff and affects all of us. In Australia, we use a secret paper ballot box. We were the first country to use this system back in 1856, which means we've been doing the same thing for over 150 years. Problems with this system have been front and center during the previous two federal elections. In 2013, West Australian voters were sent back to the polling places at a cost of $20 million because a ballot box fell off the back of a truck. In our most recent election, we were left without a prime minister for eight days. But what I want us to think about for a minute is what happens after you fill out your ballot paper? What happens after you put it into the ballot box? We have to trust that everything happens correctly for our vote, and we have to trust that everything happens correctly for all the votes. We have to trust that the election workers do their job, we have to trust that the election observers do their job, and we have to trust the scrutineers do their job. We have to trust a lot of people, and we have to trust a lot of procedures. There is widespread pressure around the world for the introduction of some form of electronic voting. At a glance, it seems to make sense. In the last decade, we have trusted most of our lives to move online. So I'm asked pretty regularly, if I can bank online, why can I not vote online? And there are some very good reasons as to why this is the case. First of all, banking online is not actually safe. Banks are there to front the cost of billions of dollars of online banking fraud each year. But more importantly, the security requirements for online voting are actually much more stringent than those for online banking. The traditional way to secure electronic votes is to sort them in a single database and build a wall around that database, hoping that no one can penetrate this wall. If someone is able to penetrate this wall, 
They have total control on the outcome of the election. It is no different for them to change one vote or all of the votes. Worse still, this places trust into the hands of the people that maintain these votes and count these votes. In the United States, many different types of electronic voting machines are in use, but they are each inherently flawed in the same way. They all operate on proprietary closed source code. This code is not subject to intense scrutiny and audit, and in some states, it is even illegal to open up a machine to see how it works. This means private companies are counting the votes in absolute secrecy. These elections decide the most powerful person in the world. How are we supposed to trust the outcome when there is no way to check how the votes are counted? It is not good enough to simply trust the people counting the votes and the governments they answer to. Elections should come with more than a result. They should come with proof of that result. So this is the question that faces electronic voting. In the presence of serious security concerns on the computer side, how do we bring the same level of auditability of paper elections into the digital age? Blockchain technology has a role to play here. With a blockchain-based system, a voter can ensure that their vote has been counted correctly and even count all of them votes themselves whilst remaining completely anonymous. This means anyone in the world can act as a scrutineer, rather than members of a political party who have a vested interest in the outcome of the election. The blockchain technology is not a panacea to every problem that electronic voting faces. We face many challenges in its introduction, but it is a step in the right direction. It is a step in the right direction to bring forward a future where we can go to vote on election day get a sausage sizzle, and a prime minister on the same day. <laughs> Blockchains will change the way that we interact with governments, banks, institutions, and each other. In the future, there may be a way for primary school students around the world to exchange the latest fad without having a trustworthy friend like Callum. Thank you. <laughs>